it is a pleasure to come here and uh, present this paper, which is building on uh, the research conducted for uh, my recent book, Poor Numbers, How We're Misled by African Development Statistics and What to Do About It, but also uh, responding a bit further to the kind of ongoing discussions uh, on arising from that debate on, on Africa's statistical tragedy uh, and concurrent the debate on, on Africa rising. Um, and some of the issues I'll be dealing with today is what kind of data do we have to interpret uh, growth, inequality, and poverty living standards across the, the past two decades? Uh, do we have any alternatives? Uh, and what do, can we do about it in terms of uh, investing in better data for development in the future? Um, let's see. First, I should uh, give a full disclosure uh, that some, some people have recently drawn my character in considerable doubt. Uh, the directors of statistics in Zambia uh, concludes in a public statement that it's clear from the asymmetric information that he had collected that Mr. Jervin had some hidden agenda, which leaves us to conclude that he was probably a hired gun meant to discredit African national accountants and eventually create work and room for more European-based techni technical assistance missions. Now, you can trust me or not, but I assure you, this is not the case. <laughs> I am not a hired gun, and if, for those who have read the book, uh, if there is one thing I do not advocate, it is those policies that would create more room for per DMs for Europe consultants. I, I actually describe that as part of, of the very problem. Um, and I should also say, uh, I think he, uh, Director of Statistics, uh, gives me way too much credit. Uh, I have not single-handedly uh, ruined African statistics. Uh, the credit is, is due elsewhere. Uh, Pali Leola uh, did uh, also make a statement to the press yesterday, uh, saying that Morton Jarvan will hijack the African Statistical Development Program unless he stopped in his tracks. Uh, I was supposed to, uh, on Sunday, I was supposed to board a plane to Addis Ababa to speak, uh, give the opening statement at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa uh, to, give, uh, to give the opening statement there in order to introduce uh, the African Working Group on National Accounts in order to see what we can do about investing in uh, development statistics. My paper is why did we need to invest in economic statistics, getting the diagnosis, right? Uh, before boarding the plane, I got a phone call from UNECA ordering me not to board the plane uh, and, and also uh, informing me that Pali Leola had given an ultimatum that he would withdraw from all working groups uh, on, unless uh, my speech got cancelled. So it's a pleasure to come here and talk to you. This uh, change of plans. Uh, you'll find the news stories, the media out there, and any kind of support. Uh, you can give me in this moment, I'll much appreciate it. Unless you happen to think I am a hired gun uh, from European powers. The book that has created all this uh, 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 commotion is Poor Numbers, How We're Misled by African Development Statistics and What to Do About It. And for those of you who are intrigued by this debate, I encourage you to read the book rather than the, the reviews by Pali Leola and actually judge for yourself. And you'll find out that this is a huge misunderstanding. Uh, my main uh, 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 contribution of the book, as we'll talk about today as well, is to first state that we do have a serious knowledge problem. Uh, we know less than we would like to think uh, about economic growth uh, in Africa. I do write a unique story. Uh, in, it's a, I'm an economic historian, so this is the, the craft of a historian, uh, writing the history of the national statistical offices in the region, how were African uh, economies measured since colonial times as it, at independence, the statistical offices had new, uh, new types of demands, new kind of tasks, new kind of administrative survey data available uh, coming with development plans and so far. I trace uh, what I, where I think if there is an African stat, uh, statistical tragedy, it goes parallel with, uh, with the type of, of, uh, of decline in economic growth, the, uh, economic shocks that faced African economies, but also statistical offices uh, in the 1980s, uh, where also the statistical offices have faced new demands uh, from, 
the growing uh, uh, from, from uh, structural adjustment programs, liberalization, the challenge of recording informal markets. And finally, I talk about how uh, the, the poverty reduction agenda has uh, uh, put new demands for new types of data and the Millennium Development Goal agenda, which is our current agenda, where we're asking statistical offices in the region to collect data on eight goals, 18 targets, and 48 indicators, uh, uh, and thereby uh, diverting resources. But I'll talk about that. My main, uh, my main contribution about this uh, book is to, to elevate the discussion we have about African development statistics and to get around doing better in investing in statistics. Today, I'll talk about GDP in Africa, uh, diagnosing the knowledge problem. I'll look a little bit on proxies, and I'll uh, look into some kind of ways in which some very brave papers have tried to fill some data gaps, and then thinking about what we should, how, how happy we are about that. Uh, as we know, there has been, uh, a, a, there's been a, a very clear symptom of a problem expressed when the, Ghana uh, uh, revised their GDP uh, in uh, November 2010, Overnight, GDP uh, almost doubled in the G GDP per capita terms as the economy was accounted, changed their uh, base year from 1993 to 2006. Uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in 2010, they changed the base year. Uh, it also meant that Ghana, before the revision, they were a poor country. After the revision, they were a lower income, uh, a middle income country. Uh, you know, this is good news, but there is a knowledge problem that does emerge. Where did this extra Ghanaian economy come from? How do we now compare Ghana 2006 to Ghana 2005, where uh, we have the series have not been backcasted? How do we compare uh, Nigeria to uh, Ghana to other countries? Uh, and it has spread a lot of reactions. Uh, you know, uh, Todd Moss uh, at the Center of Global Development uh, exclaimed, boy, we really don't know anything before he moved on to, to note that if this could happen in Ghana overnight without observers really knowing about it, what then about other countries that are less uh, closely observed? Uh, Andy Sumner and Charles Kenny took the good news in this and said it proves that Ghana escaped the poverty trap. There is no bottom billion. They, they went out of it overnight. UN, United Nations Development Program said this is a statistical illusion. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals indicator did not change overnight. Meanwhile, Shanta Dravajan, uh, after having uh, heard about the revision and read, read uh, my paper on this, declared Africa's statistical tragedy. So that's where we're, we're getting at. Uh, and it turns out news after this is uh, pointing to the direction that Ghana is not a singular case. Uh, the base year currently being used for accounting for economic growth in Nigeria is from 1990. That means that we do, it's now approaching quarter of a century since we had reasonably accurate GDP statistics of what is probably the biggest economy in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and I'm saying probably uh, because one of the, the big stakes that comes out of this is that if the rebasing is as big as they have announced it will be before it is ready, I might add, uh, and it would imply that it might jump out jump South Africa. Uh, GDP in Africa in total increases by at least 15%. And it should be a bit striking that there is currently existing about 40 Malawis inside of Nigeria, uh, which is not accounted for, which I will talk about. Uh, affects how we think about long-term trends in not only growth, but also poverty and inequality. So what do we know about income and growth in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, basing from, from how you can download the data from the World Bank database, you would think that you know quite a lot because there you find uh, uh, data from every year, from every country from 1960 to 2012, all looking downloadable as functional equivalents. Now we know, right now, we know that we cannot possibly compare Ghana GDP per capita with Nigeria GDP per capita. That would simply be misleading and tell us nothing about what is really going on. Uh, and then. This is also at stance with the fact that some countries have not in 2012. According to the UNECA report, the lag time is on average two years. Uh, so it means that uh, most countries are now working on their 2010 estimates. So how come uh, we are now already publishing estimates for 2012? Another thing which I talked about, when Ghana uh, did publish a new series, it, base year, new series in 2006, it was not backcast. 
So we have a break series. We don't know where this extra income comes from. We have a reasonable accurate picture in 1993. We have a reasonable uh, picture of uh, 2006. It's anybody's guess what went on in between. Uh, so how do they come up with these numbers? Or more specifically, where does the international databases get their da uh, data from? Well, some of you might know this, but uh, I hope at least now everybody knows, it, they come from statistical services. For you have to go to the statistical offices. So even though you download a, a GDP statistic from the World Bank, the observation is not better than the one at the local level. So we have to use, uh, this is a distinction between primary and secondary data. You have to use the skills of a historian or the questions of a journalist. Who made this observation? Under what conditions was the observation made? How good is that observation? Is there any reasons why I would think it is biased in any direction. And I think we've forgotten to do so. Um, here's the Ghana Statistical Services, where I conducted my interview with Duncan, um, my head of macroeconomic statistics in Ghana, before the revision. Here's the informal sector, right here. It's the peanut uh, saleswoman uh, there where I used to buy my lunch. Uh, um, I asked Duncan, you know, uh, is she covered in the new estimates? Um, he said, it's just peanuts. But it turns out uh, when you do add up these new service sectors, it does really make a, quite a difference. Uh, here's the Nigerian Living Standard Survey still in bags in Abuja, Nigeria. They're still inputting the data and we're still awaiting the new results. Uh, so that's what I've been doing. That's the basis of the book is to ask how are, what kind of sources do you have, what kind of data are, do you have do you have labor data? Do you have a survey of the informal sector? I've done uh, my legwork on this uh, in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, and Malawi. In addition, I did a survey of all these countries, and my question has been: How has uh, uh, these uh, countries measured their economic growth and so forth? Now, in the book, I give also a historical thing, so I'm using an archival work to tell how this is going on from 1950 onwards. Uh, today. I'll focus in on, on the last two decades and particularly painting a accurate picture of how much do we know. So the, the basic kind of things, as you already started to, to realize, is to think about uh, how long, how, you know, this is a survey done, uh, published in the book. I did ask a couple of questions like, when did you last publish an estimate? So what's the lag time between, uh, in some countries, in 2010, and Ghana had a 2009 date. They were up to date, yeah? But other countries did not have. Some countries would simply have no information on it whatsoever. That might have been because there is no GDP data, like in Equatorial Guinea. And, uh, uh, or it might be that they were too busy doing other things, like in uh, Ivory Coast and, and, and Congo, understandably, with the civil unrest at the time and so forth. Um, the other important thing is, of course, the base here. Now, we have learned that uh, the reason why uh, uh, Ghana's economy uh, was took such a big jump is that they have now a new base year for 2006, uh, whereas, you know, Nigeria is at 1990. So they, these data are not comparable. Uh, and, and there is other estimates which I, but I'd rather not. You can engage with that table as well. Uh, the good thing is I did my table in uh, 2010 in response to the publication of the book. Not only is the book peer-reviewed uh, and fact-checked in all possible ways, but I also had the honor of having my book uh, being uh, replicated. Uh, the study of the book has been replicated by both the IMF and the African Development Bank in, in recently re re uh, released reports. Uh, and this is the IMF data, uh, and the report uh, by the African Development Bank is not called poor numbers, it's called uh, the re reliability of African uh, GDP estimates and so forth. But we are, uh, the, to summarize that, uh, the, my survey uh, published, I had a sample of 37 countries. Uh, in comparison, uh, AFDB managed to secure the responses from 34 countries. Uh, probably were in a bit of a hurry. IMF uh, uh, managed to get uh, this kind of information from 45 countries. Uh, the IMF recommendation was to have a base here every fifth year. Seven countries met this in 2011, according to my study. Uh, according to the latest IMF, only four meets this, and that, but uh, IFDB reports that nine do. Um, you can, uh, that means that they have different information. Uh, the mean base here is 2,000 um, in all the studies. Uh, so it means that we are uh, 13 years behind. Um, according to the African Development Bank, eight countries, and according to IMF, 13 countries have base years that are more than two decades old. 
This is not only a problem then of comparable GDP data, well, as you see, it's also a problem of comparable metadata. So it's manifest to a little bit about how little we know that we cannot, AFDB and IMF cannot agree upon the sources and methods, not even baselines estimates, in the same reports published in the same month this year. Implications for the growth evidence, as I detailed in my paper and my book, uh, and so uh, any ranking, of course, according to GDP is going to be misleading. Any statement of growth over the short and medium term might be picking up statistical growth, changes in methods, as well as actual real, uh, uh, real productivity growth, which we would like to think. So there's a mismatch between how we often interpret the GDP data and what is actually going on. Um, and very recent growth data, for a couple of reasons, is likely to be very overestimated, clearly, in the case of Ghana. Uh, although you try to smoothen this out, you still have the revi revision effect with you. Uh, and, and it's also true that the GDP per capita of many countries are now underestimated. As we saw, Nigeria is richer than we think. Uh, but that also means that currently Nigeria is growing faster than you think for a couple of reasons, because uh, you have a lot of statistical growth if your GDP measure is not exhaustive, for instance. So, what are the alternatives which scholars have been using? Um, uh, this is, yeah, okay. Uh, that is rainfall by uh, Miguel et al. So discussed in the paper. One thing is to do is to try to control for GDP measures using rainfall. For a lot, I'm, as I discuss, uh, um, I think that's a too narrow type of measure. We, we are often in, interested in the stuff that is not fluctuating with rainfall, but rather that which fluctuates with policy, and therefore you get the very opposite kind of GDP measure than you would like. And it's also this thing that it's kind of weird using GDP data and controlling from rainfall when you know that that's how they estimated agricultural output in the first place. So if you know how crop forecasting works, then you know that often rainfall data is the one that you use to estimate those very output data to begin with. So you're kind of redoing what you already did, but Miguel didn't know that. Assets, Young et al. As, uh, Young, not et al., he did this all by himself. Uh, Young, uh, in 2012, Journal of Political Economy, does, uh, yeah? Yeah, but, but still, people are suggesting that maybe you could use trends in rainfall and so forth. Well, okay, that's fine. I agree as well. The instrument approach is quite different, yeah. Clearly. But that's a way of getting along, you know, that you've... There changes in GDP that are not explained by measurement, you know. So it's a, a way of... So instrument is rather how it do. But thanks for the, the clarification. Uh, assets, data used by Young and others also... Uh, uh, it has different kinds of problems. Uh, there are stocks, not flow, uh, and other people have shown, Klaas and Natal have shown that this is not uh, really working out as a proxy. Uh, luminosity, many people are suggesting that we should measure economic growth from outer space. Yes, that has some types of uh, 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 advantages, no bias perhaps, except if there is legislation about li outside lighting, that is. Uh, but there is uh, also the problem, if you are an economic historian like me, uh, you, have to, you can't get data from the 1980s then because you don't have satellite imagery unless you're able to travel as fast as you can capture light, recapture light, which is a bit hard to do. Uh, what I'm arguing in the paper here is that none of them give a predictable outcome and all science steps the issue of seeing like a state. Measurement is not only knowledge, it's governance, accountability, and policy circles. That's well displayed by, I don't think... Uh, World Bank, for instance, will issue a which is the lightest country in the world kind of table uh, at a time soon. Uh, so filling the data gaps, how is people dealing with you know, making brave assumptions between it? So I'll just take a two minutes to go through. One very much famous paper is uh, African poverty is falling much fo faster than you think. They claim since 1995, African poverty has been falling steadily. They then use you know, the wider data and the PVT data and calculate elasticities and trends in inequality on this. The problem is that they have only 118 surveys, so that there's you know, a lot of the actual years in this data set is, of course, made up. And not only that, uh, countries which they are actually claiming, they even in the paper they have a figure of data on Angola and Nigeria, but they do not uh, have data of that in wider, as you would know, the people who know it. 
The same thing happens when, when uh, the rise of the middle class, they think it increased from 11 to 15 percent. Again, they have a method uh, of using a synthetic panel, um, and they only have 84 observations. And the short story is that uh, these 35 countries are not randomly picked. We are, we are missing the, the big countries, and we're missing the poor countries. So therefore, to go from these observations, when you have as much as above 1,000 gaps from actually having annual series, you're actually making very, very bold guesswork indeed. Conclusion, our current estimates are doubly biased. We know less about poor countries, and we know less about poor, poor people in those poor economies. Uh, this knowledge problem stands in a striking contrast with the demand for numbers in the development community. Everyone wants measurable uh, impact of, of development policy. The Africa rising debate has increased this even further. There is even now a demand for statistics from, from uh, investment banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so there is an increasing demand for statistics. I argue that uh, uh, numbers matter. Any evaluation of Africa's development must begin and end with a careful evaluation of the growth and income evidence. Without such analysis, one runs the risk of reporting statistical fiction. And poor numbers are too important to be dismissed as just that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.